Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to another episode here on the Sit Rep Podcast. I am your host, Oriskany Jim, and today we are back at Das Creek House and the South Florida Miniature Gaming Club for another look at Mark Ritchie's tactical combat system in 15mm. Now, you guys are familiar with the channel. We've used this system quite a bit in recent months to take a look at various engagements on both sides of World War II, both Europe and the Pacific. Today, we're going to change gears a little bit and take a look at the Korean War, which of course takes place 1950 to 53. So, most of you guys are probably familiar with the basics of the Korean War. It starts off in the summer of 1953 with huge numbers of North Korean troops, the KPA, Korean People's Army, or North Korean People's Army, however you want to, you know, however you want to think about it. They're coming across the 38th parallel in huge numbers, and they're largely overwhelming the small numbers of relatively unprepared Republic of Korea, South Korean forces, and what few American Army and Marine forces are in place. The United Nations and the rest of the U.S. military are hastily gathering together whatever kind of reinforcements they can and get them into Korea as fast as possible to redress this situation. In the meanwhile, the outnumbered American Republic of Korea and UN forces sort of get cornered into a tiny little vestige at the very tip of the South Korean peninsula there, infamously known to history as the Pusan Perimeter. This battle is part of the Pusan Perimeter. In the early part of August 1950, the North Koreans put together another big shove based largely around 4th Infantry Division to crack this in uh, an offensive they called the Nakton River Campaign, tripping off this Battle of Obogni Ridge, which is what we're going to look at today. So we are going to have four players in today's game. The first, myself, of course, Ariska Nijem. I'm playing elements of the U.S. Marine Corps because, of course, I am. Our little Marine Corps force here is generally built around a 5th Marine Regiment, or old friend in the 5th Marines, which at the time was part of what they called back then 1st Provisional Marine Brigade. This was kind of before the Marine Corps came up with the Marine Expeditionary Brigade concept that we're more familiar with today. My partner, Mike, meanwhile, is going to be playing elements of 24th U.S. Infantry. There were U.S. Army units also in this battle. So the overall gist is, and this is a very, very broad overview, 24th Infantry is being hit by huge numbers of North Korean forces. They're starting to buckle, they're starting to give way, they're giving as good as they get as they go, but they need help, and the Marines are on hand to rush forward and try to address the situation. Our opponents are Steve and John Sowerby, playing elements of 4th KPA, Korean People's Army Infantry Division, and a whole lot of tanks. Okay, so here we are starting off at the beginning of turn one, where we see huge numbers of North Korean T-34-85 tanks coming on their side of the table and attacking this hill here. This is part of Mike's position, 24th Infantry, sort of a holding forward position. Spoiler alert, these guys are not gonna last very long. Again, nothing against the US Army, but they're up against a North Korean human wave a huge stretch of, uh, I think it was 109th Tank Battalion attached to 4th KPA Infantry Division, complete with BA-64 armored cars of all things. I can't believe they were still using these. Um, it, it's an overwhelming force. This hill here is a speed bump. They're going to drop a bunch of bazookas, recoilless rifles, some rifle fire, and then they're going to get the hell out of there. What they are desperately waiting for is more army reinforcements, artillery, and some U.S. Marines to come back and help them out. And me, oh my, what could this be? One of the T-34-85 tanks is already burning. She's a fire. What could have possibly caused this, you ask? Could it be elements of, I think it was 5th Marine Tank Company, part of 5th Marines already on the table? So yeah, there we go with some of my Easy 8s. One of them has a dozer blade and they have already managed to get a very, very long shot. I will confess, I'm not gonna lie, I did have some pretty, pretty hot dice, is all I'm gonna say, in these first couple turns of this game. Um, a lot of players like to complain when they have bad dice. I fully acknowledge when the dice are on my side. Lady Luck just, I don't know, man, I brought her a bouquet of roses and a box of chocolates before this game started because she was fluttering her sexy little eyelashes at me all through 
the first couple turns of this game. Here we see some of my army units um, that uh, I have command on this side of the battlefield waiting for the Marines to come up and launch that counterattack. Here are some more Marine units. So I brought in those two 76 millimeter armed Shermans uh, left over from World War II. I, I guys are clearly gonna see there's a lot of World War II armor on the table here. And for my second element of tanks, I brought in two M26 Pershings. I think these were the only two Pershings in the Korean War at this time. There was gonna be a lot more later on. But right now, the U.S. Marines were like, look, we're hugely outnumbered by North Korean tanks, T-3485s. They're not the best, but they're nothing to sneeze at. North Koreans also had uh, small platoons just out on this battlefield. Clearly, I mean, the Korean War isn't really known as a major tank uh, sort of a campaign. But in that first summer, there was a fair amount of actual tank combat. And uh, the Battle of Abnagmi Ridge here definitely... It's kind of considered the first major tank battle of the Korean War. As the war stagnates and sort of solidifies in place near the 38th parallel during the whole, you know, endless peace negotiations that were going to drag on for two more years when the war sort of stabilizes a little bit, tanks become more of a mobile artillery kind of a thing. But again, that first summer when the war in Korea was very, very mobile, yeah, you'd see quite a few uh, tank engagements. The problem here is that the Americans and their UN allies were terribly outnumbered. The Soviets were providing North Koreans with huge numbers of World War II surplus. I mean, clearly, anyone who's familiar with the Eastern Front after, say, October 1943, November, December, let's just say late 43, you're used to T-3485s. It's one of the most common tanks ever built, especially during the, uh, the World War II period. BA-64s for crying out loud. I can't believe you know anyone was still using those. Nevertheless, here they are. So I've got those buildings that you saw a second ago. Here we have some of Mike's infantry, the, the survivors of that infantry. They did a heck of a lot of damage, especially to the infantry of that North Korean attack force. And they're now pulling back off that hill to meet my Marine infantry coming up and is hiding out in those three buildings we see there along the side of the road. So the victory conditions are basically the North Koreans have to get a single armored vehicle off our side of the table. So we have to establish and stabilize a cohesive line. Okay, here we are beginning turn four and there is yet more North Korean armor. These are my T-3485s by the way. I mean, my miniatures. I don't command them, unfortunately. I would just have to turn around and go back to um, <laughs> go home. Yeah, they have smoked my Jeep. They have smoked my Chaffee light tank, my M24 Chaffee light tank. They've smoked my forward radio position. My little holding hill, so to speak, over here on the left-hand side of the table has been completely caved in. I thought I was gonna be able to bring in some, uh, my Pershings a little bit sooner and bring their fire to bear. I did not see another hill directly in front of them. So they get, they got on some high ground, they got hold down, and then realized there was a hill between them and a T-3485 so I couldn't shoot through. So I had to laterally redeploy them over there to the right, as you see. And uh, they're doing a little better there, but um, yeah, it's gonna get tough. Meanwhile, my two Shermans have also laterally redeployed. Over here to the left, they're in those dry rice paddies. They're hauled down behind those embankments and we're still doing our best to pick up some more of these T-3485s. There are so many of them. Mark had to bring all the 15 millimeter T-3485s I, he had. You see, there are his miniatures. I already showed you my miniatures. And between the two of us, uh, we both have pretty substantial World War II collections. Neither of us still had enough T-3485s to put the entire North Korean tank force, again, I think that's 109th Tank Battalion, on the table at once. And so we started putting on what we could and then like replacing Rex with T-34-76s. So this is a pretty big battle and it's starting to get a little stressful. I am not gonna lie. Okay, so here, once again, we see my M26 Pershings. Everybody's read about the M26 Pershing. It came in, it was the new American heavy tank. It came in at the very, very, very end of World War II. Definitely too late to make any kind of a big splash. And as impressive as that 90 millimeter L53 gun may have been, it was terribly let down by some awful quality American anti-tank ammunition stocks. 
The good news is it's 1950 now. There's been five years and we have sorted out the problems with that tank ammunition and Mark Ritchie does have rules for that. His armor piercing or his APCR uh, special ammunition load. It's a very limited ammunition type. I only have so many shots with it as opposed to my regular armor piercing ammunition. But holy crap, man, this, uh, the special Pershing ammunition fired from a 90 millimeter gun goes through T-34s like crap through a goose. I'm not even playing around. Okay, here we go, beginning with turn five. And um, okay, so my now that my Pershings are finally in position and my camera's finally in focus, I am starting to knock out some of these T-34 85s. The bad news is he's bringing on still more armor, this time in the form of the Su-76 assault gun. Again, a really terrible gun. It's basically a Soviet 76.2 millimeter divisional gun married with a T-70 light tank chassis. Left over from 1942, North Koreans are still using it. And another big problem we're having is he's bringing in some other aforementioned 76.2 millimeter field guns. And those things are just starting to drop indirect fire missions on my infantry there. You see that big group of Marine infantry in that road with all the red counters on them. Those are all weapons. His infantry is starting to get damned effective. And uh, we're going to have to come up with a solution for that because we're starting to get a handle on the tank problem but now his artillery is becoming a threat. Okay, it's time to get serious. I'm bringing in some Marine air power. Now, the way that Mark runs air power here in his tactical command system is, I mean, obviously the payload is already set before the scenario. As the player, you don't really get to you know, control that, which I actually kind of like. Uh, this is something I also like in Battle Group, where you as the company or battalion commander on the ground, you don't have command over the Air Force overhead. It's a resource that you can request, and once it shows up, you can kind of point it where you want it. At the same time, dude, it doesn't just, you know, obey your every command, and it can't just appear whenever you want it to. And it's definitely not going to be carrying the exact ordinance. Perfect point. I would much rather have some 5-inch rockets for anti-tank work here. Instead, I have napalm. Wrong tool for the wrong job, but I'm going to make the best of it I can. Uh, the strike is not terribly accurate. I was trying to line up on those T-34s in front and the Su-76 in back. You can see where that did not happen. Here come my 50 cals. Um, I completely missed the T-34. I am hitting the Su-76, and that Su-76 is an open-topped vehicle. So the Su-76 is more or less smoked. Uh, my 50 cals sprayed pretty badly into there, killed a lot of people in that vehicle because again it is a top tank and then my second napalm last was close enough to force the rest of the crew enough wounds to where they bailed okay it's an open top vehicle if you bail out of your tank in the middle of a napalm explosion you're basically jumping off you know talk about out of the frying pan into the fire i mean literally uh <laughs> you jump out of a burning tank into the burning ground around you and well long story short you're pretty much smoked my napalm also had enough of a blast radius to clean all of the tank rider infantry off of the back of that T-34. There was a slim chance I might have started a fire in the exhaust or the fuel. It is uh, an engine deck there, and you know we all know that a Molotov cocktail can set a tank on fire. I am dropping napalm, and eh, I'm too far away. Again, you see where the angle is there with the explosions and where the T-34s are. I just didn't get lucky enough there. Uh, as hot as my dice were, they weren't hot enough to. Uh, take out either of those T-34s. But I did take out the infantry and the Su-76, so not complaining. Okay, my Sherman's there, you saw burning. It's like locusts piling up on a window pane. Sooner or later, it's gonna break. My two sh uh, Pershings are doing okay. The two 76 millimeter armed Shermans that my friend Mike is bringing on, you can't really see them on the table right now, are doing okay. So we got a total of six tanks. Um, minus the chaffy that's also toast. So we've got seven tanks. Three of them are now burning. It's, uh, it's getting tough. So as the Pershings and the new Shermans were sort of getting into position on both wings, the first two Shermans I brought on in the center were sort of holding the line. And I kind of put them in a pretty exposed position where they could cover both flanks. And, uh, man, they knocked out a lot of T-34-85s. I think they got at least four, three or four of them. But uh, they did finally go down. They did buy us some time though, so 
hopefully we'll be able to uh, to redress the situation here. The problem is there's a lot more Soviet armor coming on the table. And again, our infantry are getting hammered. Army and Marine infantry alike are getting beaten up pretty bad by offboard Korean artillery and those towed 76 millimeter divisional guns I mentioned earlier. Okay, here we are beginning turn eight. And yeah, the situation continues to deteriorate slash hold. It's, it's a very tense game. Um, this game did not almost, you know, immediately shake out one way or the other. So, again, you see my M24 Chaffee already burning there. That's pretty much the end of my army force there on that little hill. So I'm now coming up with that Marine Infantry Force you just saw a minute ago. And, again, those two Pershings are now backed up behind the hill. I'm denying targets. There is a hill. You see me feeling there around the felt. I am backed up behind the hill. So what that allows me to do is fire my Pershings against John's tanks over here across the table while denying Steve tanks who are right in front of me a shot at me. So I'm using terrain to at least try to divide the enemy's fires a little bit. Sooner or later, Steve's T-34s there are going to have to rush past my Pershings. And by then I'll be in reaction fire and hopefully I'll pick them off then. But for now, I'm trying to use terrain to deny the North Koreans the chance to use their numbers to full effect. I'm using terrain to divide their force, to make it a little bit more manageable, again, because they have a huge numerical superiority. And the Soviet 85mm gun in the T-34-85 was nothing to joke about. That would go through a Sherman with no problems whatsoever. It's a World War II 85mm gun. It's only 3 millimeters smaller than an 88 and it's not that much longer than the old L56 88s. It's, it's a scary gun if you get hit by it. All right, beginning on turn nine. And here is where things get desperate. And no, I'm not even kidding. So the Soviet T-34s have now reached my hill. The army has fallen. The Marines have come in. The Marines are holding that hill just with infantry. I tried to bring up my Pershings to support. John dropped a smoke screen in front of me. So when my Pershings finally did kind of get back into the battle here, no dice. Meanwhile, we have BA-64s rushing down the road and they get the road movement rate. They're about to break off the table. I actually, I mean, I was joking around, of course, but I was kidding around with John. I was like, John, if this game, because we were playing for like six hours, if this game comes down as a North Korean victory, because one of your crappy little BA-64 scooted off the table down this road, I will slap somebody. Mike is doing the best he can with his Shermans and small arms to try and put a hole in those BA-64s, but this game is tight. Okay, here's another view about how scary things really are. You see my roadblock there, uh, that truck across the middle of the road. My Pershings are still smoked. So I have to pull them off the firing line, more or less abandoning that Marine infantry platoon on that hill we were looking at a second ago. Because if he scoots around that empty truck and those wounded Marines laying in the middle of the road with that BA-64, he's pretty much going to scoot off the table. Meanwhile, here we are. The guy I'm pointing out there, that bazooka, this is his second bazooka shot. He did hit that T-34 and finally knock it out on his second shot. It cost me about half that platoon because holy crap, those T-34s put two machine guns each into uh, my Marine infantry there on that hill. Uh, they paid a hell of a price, but they did finally stop that part of the North Korean offensive. Meanwhile, my friend Mike stopped that part of the North Korean offensive over there with his tank and machine gun fire shooting up the last of John Sowerby's BA-64s. Okay, so this bazooka shot, um, again, the first one did hit, but it kind of bounced off the armor. The second one, it hit. I then had to roll hit location, a 15 or higher on a D20, because that T-34 from my vantage was technically hull down. So a hull shot would not hit. When you're hull down, a hull shot obviously hits the dirt in front of the tank. That's what hull down is for. So I think my first bazooka shot went in the dirt. My second one hit the front armor of the T-34 turret. It was the front armor, unfortunately, but did finally score the hit, knocking out that last T-34 on that hill. And that's it. The North Koreans are now out of armored vehicles. 
We have two Pershings left, we have one Sherman left, and some pretty badly shot up infantry. This goes down as an American win. U.S. Army, U.S. Marine Corps win. So, thanks very much everybody for coming by to check us out again. Tango Mike as always, we'll be in touch very soon.